Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. This is the podcast where we tackle the why we do what we do question with a combination of intellectual curiosity and real world levity. Uh, okay, so are you trying to say that we're both serious and fun? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so why don't you just say that? <laughs> right. We're serious about the topic and we have fun talking about it. Okay, good, good point. So let's try this. This is the podcast where we're serious about understanding why we do what we do. And we like having fun doing it. Okay. All right. I give it much better. <laughs> okay. You did good. And it's having some fun here, right? Yes. All right. So, Tim, I've got a question for you. All right. Which do you think is better when it comes to getting people to engage in new behaviors? Give them lots of choices or only give them a few? So neoclassical economic theory says that not only people prefer more options, but they can refine their choices better when they've got lots to choose from. However, 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 behavioral science informs us that too many options can be bad for decision making. And Sheena Iyengar's work on the tyranny of choice and her jelly study, great example of that. All right, exactly. And this is where the research of our guest comes in. But his work is not as simple as just choosing the flavor of jelly you're going to take home from the supermarket. His work is about choosing what actions you're going to take to help mitigate climate change. So how options are presented is very important in the world that we live in. Definitely. Our guest in this episode is Ruben Klein. He is an associate professor of political science and the director of the Center for Behavioral Political Economy at Stony Brook University in New York. And we met up with Ruben at the Nobeck Conference at the University of Pennsylvania. He was presenting his findings to the students in the Masters of Norms and Behavior Change program at UPenn. Ruben wanted to find out what size list would have the greatest impact on people acting on climate change ideas. He and his colleagues gave people lists of 1, 5, 10, and 20 ways to impact their carbon footprint, and he had some very interesting results to share. Here's a hint. It's not just about the size of the list that matters. Getting people to act also has to do with how difficult it is to implement each item on the list. Yeah, his findings are very cool and can help us sort through lots of situations where we have both easy and complex actions to take. With that, sit back, choose a drink from the large variety of beverage options that have huge <laughs> different aspects that you can enjoy for our conversation with Professor Ruben Klein. So, Ruben, you are going to be presenting at the uh, at the conference here. What, what are you? What are you? Pre you're presenting a paper that you guys have. So tell us a yes. little bit about that, and tell us a little bit about the research behind it. Right. So, um, so the basic uh, research we're presenting. So, I was a little bit surprised. I'm delighted to be here, and also a little bit surprised, given that I'm this is a conference on norms and. This research is much less directly related to norms than much of the research that's being uh, presented here. Uh, but so basically, the, the basic idea is uh, this idea of, of choice overload. So this has mostly been studied in, in the sort of consumer context that uh, this sort of counterintuitive idea that giving people more choices actually might make them worse off, right, which is sort of isn't possible under sort of neoclassical economics, right? Yep. The, the more choices can't make you worse off. Um, and uh, so, again, most of that has been done in the consumer setting. We're interested, so most of my research is about climate change mitigation, although typically I study sort of cooperation in climate change mitigation and kind of strategic things related to that. But uh, we're interested in climate change mitigation and whether telling people that there's a lot of different ways they can help save the earth, which sounds like a good thing, might actually make them less likely to do so. Uh, that was the basic idea. How did you operationalize that? Okay, so yes, so we basically, so we had a, uh, we did a survey, sort of a kind of representative national sample survey. Uh, so U.S. only. Yeah, right. in okay. the base in the U.S., yes, that's correct. Um, and uh, we had, so it was two, done in two waves. In the first wave, we had about 1,400 respondents. And in the second wave, of course, you always get some attrition. I think there were 950 or something. Um, that, you know, followed up with the second second wave. And so what we did was we randomly assigned, we had four different groups, and basically we randomly assigned them 
to get different numbers. We said, here, here is a list of ways you can help with climate change, uh, help to you know, prevent climate change. And we gave, depending on the group they were in, they got either one of these behaviors. Uh, so we, we randomly pulled behaviors from a list of 25 okay. that we had pre-tested uh, on, with a different set of people, asking them how difficult they thought these items were to do, right? And so we had 25 of these items. Uh, we actually started with 30. We dropped five, the, very, the ones that were rated the very most difficult and the least difficult. Um, and... Um, and then we, we randomly assigned four groups. We gave you know, one group just one, one, another group five items from this list, another group 10 items from this list, and another group 20 items from this list. And you know, our hypothesis was that uh, at least on the upper end of this number of, of items that you get, you, uh, we should start to see people feeling like they're less likely to make a difference or something. So right. we measured, so I, so I should have said, so there's two interest, two measures we're interested in. I said that we had these two waves, right? So the first wave we measured, we asked them, after we gave them this list of items, we asked them a couple of different questions that measure efficacy. Basically, how much do they think what they do makes a difference, right? right? So we had four different items basically for that, uh, four different things that roughly get at that idea. And then um, and then in the follow-up in the second wave, which was a week, uh, roughly a week afterwards, uh, we asked them if they had actually done any of the behaviors that they were, uh, that they had been shown in this previous wave and we a- gave actually them the Actually putting it into action, the things yes. that they it, said it that they, had they, they believed yeah. that were right. important. Yes. What did they do? Yeah, exactly. So, and so, and again, of course, you know, uh, these are just self-reported measures, so we have no idea if they're truthfully reporting them or not. Um, but just taking them at face value, like I said before, you know, we, we, we pre-tested these difficulties, right? So the mm-hmm. level of difficulty, right? And so uh, it's the, the effect that we see is not as straightforward as we thought it would be. We thought that just, well, may, at least once you get up to 20, people should feel less efficacious because yeah. like, oh my God, I can do all this stuff. Oh my God, I can do, I have to do all this stuff. Oh, it's right? too much. <laughs> right? yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cognitive yeah. overload yeah, yeah. That's, kicking that's, in. Yeah, that's, that, that's what we thought. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. It does happen. So whether you give them one, five or two, 10 doesn't seem to matter. They're basically, the effect is the same. But 20 does matter, but in a sort of complicated way uh, that we still don't have a good handle on exactly why. When you get 20 relatively easy items, right. you are less likely, you feel less efficacious and are, are, are actually perform fewer of these actions a week later or report which, and this performing is, which, fewer. Which is aligned with cognitive overload. P- possibly. But, but, but these are the easy things. These, but these are, the, are easy the easy things. things. So, yeah, so we might think that 20 is, wouldn't yeah. be so bad you wouldn't if they're so. the easy yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but maybe um, precisely because they're easy. So here's possibly where, th- this might be where the norms come in. But, but, you know, again, this is sort of speculative, I guess. But so possibly, so if you see items that, so a lot of these items are like turn off the lights when you leave a room, rinse dishes in cold water, things like this. So well, in those you know were ones that were easy. rated relatively easy. But then you think, wow, if I get twenty of these, they're easy. I really should do them all, right? Should be a normative term, right? Exactly. I really should, but man, that sounds like a lot to do, <laughs> right? So maybe I end up just feel overwhelmed by the whole thing now. And I guess if you have more difficult items, you can sort of justify maybe not doing them better and also then uh, maybe do them. Another aspect might be, so again, it's hard to say because, you know, as far as we're aware, all of the research on this is done like in a consumer choice context. Yeah. So it's also possible that, um, but but the, the meta, so there's a couple meta analyses that have been done and look at, you know, so overall, if you look at all these studies, it looks like there's no effective choice overload. Okay. Uh, the, the sort of at least these two meta analyses that, that we've looked at, um, if you average across all the studies they look at, basically there's zero effect. Okay. But they do find that certain factors affect them. And one of them is the ability to make trade-offs, right? So if it's easier to make trade-offs at these items than choice overload is less likely to happen. Okay. Right? And so I think maybe if you have some uh, variance in the difficulty, that differentiates them. And so then 
it, 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 so then it's easier to make trade-offs. So that right? trade-off is, opportunity, it, it if they're makes, all easy, yeah. how do you how do you how do you, you know which how one do you to, rate which like, one never, to, to yeah, yeah. something like this? Even I'm never going to do all twenty. Even though I don't have to choose only one, yeah, I could yeah. choose all of sure, them, right? Sure. The, or or sure. you could just choose one. Yeah, or I, or I could. But just maybe choose, so. But they're again, not mutually exclusive. No, they aren't mutually exclusive. So that's the difference. So that's a big difference here between the consumer side of this research, which is that you know typically what they're looking at is you want to buy a product. How does the number of products you could potentially buy affect this? But you're still only going to buy one of them. You're not going to buy 12 different computers right. or something or 12 different TVs. I'm only going to buy one TV. Probably. Uh, at least <laughs> at least in this current decision, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I might buy 12 TVs. Yeah. Kurt, okay. Kurt so, could be Mr. Yeah. 12 TVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But so, it, so it's not really – so it's unclear, I guess, how – the fact that these aren't mutually exclusive decisions that are fi- uh, potentially, you know, uh, uh, cumulative decisions. Right. That how that affects people's behavior. Because I, I, I literally think there's been no work done on that context. That's fascinating, though, um, because you think about the implications of that, right? It's, it's, it's not a mutually exclusive. So I'm not having to choose one over all these others. The mm-hmm. component that you talked about before, right? Mm-hmm. That I, I'm going to have to make a choice based yeah. on here. I could actually do all of these and yeah. that, there's no research there. Yeah. Sure. And you would think that in that sort of setting, choice overload should be even stronger because then it's like you're, you're really overwhelmed with all of these right. choices because right. it's like one thing like, okay, uh, you know, I got all these 20, t- 400 TVs I can choose from. I'll oh, just like eeny, meeny, miny, mo it or something, right? right? And then forget about it. Is that uh, a scientific term? It's, it's very scientific. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 Once you get little, tenure, you know these things, yeah, yeah, right? Eeny, meeny, miny, It's a very, very technical uh, uh, procedure. Okay. Uh, uh, but so when you have many things, then like maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. You, maybe you think, oh, you really sweat over like, should I do all of them? Like even like trying to whittle down which you should do, I think becomes a task in and of itself, right? Even to think like, well, cause first you have to make the decision, I guess, before you decide which to do, how m- much effort am I gonna put into this whole exactly. thing, right? Yeah. And so then, then I think that might be where, you know, the, the, having variation in the difficulty of them might help because then it gives you something to sort of differentiate these things and kind of whittle down this thing and make sense of this big mass of kind of choices that confront you. So that's so going back to the the original hypothesis on this though, right? Uh-huh. Of looking at this and saying, yeah, there is this this cognitive overload that happens. Mm-hmm. And yet what you found at least from this one study was mm-hmm. that really doesn't play an an impact on this. So so the implications of that for at least from this climate change and saying, here's a list of things that you can do. Uh-huh. I mean, the implications are it doesn't really matter then it, well, it, what, how big that list is yeah. to, to a certain degree. To a certain degree, right? But now there's some yeah, aspects that, on, on that. that, that maybe, that, right. So, but maybe that it's important. Again, you know, we need more than one study on this. Of course. Is, is, uh, yeah. So, you know, if there's any potential funders listening, they should, of course, fund f- further studies. Yeah. Um, contact, you, contact you directly. Yes, exactly. Yes. Ruben, yeah. Ruben.Klein at sonybrook.edu. Uh, It'll yeah. be in the show notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but, uh, but, 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 yeah, it, so it's possible that, you know, maybe when, it, if, you know, organizations or, or governments or whatever are interested in, in sort of fomenting this kind of uh, pro-social behavior that perhaps they do need to make these lists, even if they make them long, make them varied. Make so them that, differential. Yeah, so. differential. And then possibly, you know, because maybe certain types of activities appeal to certain types of different people, right? And right. So, so riding riding a bike yes. uh, instead of driving, yes. particularly in Minnesota where sure. Tim and I live in, throughout yeah. the entire year. Yeah, it's a little pretty bit hard, harder. Pretty tough ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people do it. But, you know, but, but if you live in but, San Diego, well, a little easier. But, yeah, but, yeah. but to that component, having that versus washing dishes in cold water, mm-hmm. those are two very different exactly. effects of, of mm-hmm. difficulty of, sure, sure, of, of sure. doing. So sure. showing that difficulty and having that trade-off, that would be an interesting component to, to really think about. So I know some of our listeners are really big climate activists. Okay. And uh, they might want to know, of this list, are there things that sort of make the most sense or have the greatest impact? You, you talked about difficulty, yeah. But what about impact? Uh, right. So uh, I don't have, I don't know. I should know which ones. Damn, I hate, I hate the stump the professor question. Yeah, That's uh, not my intent. No, no, but it, no, no, no. It's not a stump. It's just that I, I should. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, so 
presumably there were probably ones that were more likely to be performed or reported having been done. I don't know what those are. Okay. Uh, okay. But probably, but you've got the data. Yeah, yeah. I just we haven't looked at it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. Um, but I will look into that because that's yeah that's an important thing. Damn so, straight. Yeah. <laughs> but I think perhaps from this, I mean, you would think like you know certainly before I had done this research, I would have. If you ask me, like, well, what kind of, if you wanted to provide someone with a list like this, what kind of list should you give them? Right. I would have said, give them a list of easy stuff to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, but and, apparently and that would have been the wrong answer. But right uh, now, you're like, saying, right, yeah, 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 that I don't know. Give, give so them a varied list. Possibly, right? yes, possibly. That might be the conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And wow. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and there is this, you know, again, there's this finding, I think, in both of these meta analyses that, you know, the ability to sort of make these trade offs among them helps in, in reducing the, the choice overload, right? right. Okay, and so, you. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, so, no, no, excuse me. Yeah. Well, uh, so how does this fit into the Department of Political Science at <laughs> good Stony question. Brook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that okay uh, if I ask that? That's a very good question. <laughs> they ask, might ask the same one. Uh, <laughs> no. So, like I said, so Stony Brook, um, so Stony Brook has a, a, a an unusual uh, political science department uh, that's heavily experimental. Uh, okay. So about we have about twenty faculty members, and probably fifteen of them do some kind of experiments. In their research, right? So, um, so Stony Brook has been historically uh, sort of uh, in the vanguard of the political psychology movement. We had some of the sort of uh, Shanto Iyengar and some of the founders of Milt Lodge oh. of the political psychology uh, that started at Stony Brook. Actually, Milt Lodge is still at Stony Brook. He's emeritus, but he's still in the office every day. Uh, uh, Shanto, you know, moved to Stanford or maybe somewhere in between. But um, but so we've had this sort of reputation as being very good at political psychology. And then at some point in the, about 10 years ago, we lost most of the political economy people that uh, were in the department. And uh, they were more traditional kinds of political economy people. Okay. And they started, uh, then the, the department said, well, let's try to rebuild our political economy program in a way that complements our sort of traditional strength in political psychology. So let's do this thing that we're going to call behavioral political economy. So okay. we sort of, you know, I mean, I don't think we coined that term, but, you know, we said, okay, we'll call it, we'll call it that. And so then we started hiring people that do... Uh, I was, I guess, probably the first person that was intentionally hired with this goal in mind uh, to start doing kind of more politically relevant, basically behavioral and experimental economics. Very That's interesting. That's very cool. Uh-huh. Yeah, so so, so cool. what are some yeah. of the other you, – you talked about your, your research just uh-huh. in general. What, what yeah. are some of the other um, kind so, of big things right. that you've been working on? So, so a lot of what I do is, um, is laboratory experiments uh, – Sort of on cooperation, but okay. framed in a way uh, in a in a climate change sort of way. So there's a sort of standard paradigm that's used now, standard game that's called the collective risk social dilemma. Okay, not the most marketable name. So <laughs> so we call it the disaster game. Oh, the disaster oh, 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 game. Oh, oh, that's marketable. Way better. Way better. It has that's a more hard. vivid we, uh, sorry, man, man from Malinsky there. is the guy who came up with this, who's a very remarkable guy. But you know, sort of that's sort of the academic, obvious academic thing to call it. So so the idea with this game is so it's a public goods game, but uh, so everybody's trying to work at a common purpose. But of course, like any public goods game, there's a you know a, 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 you know sort of some incentive to free ride. The difference here is that so uh, say you have a group of so you do it in a group a group of four people. You give them each a hundred bucks, and you say uh, we don't give them that much money because we can't pay them that much. But let's just say hundred <laughs> bucks. Pretend. It's a round number. Yeah. Hundred yeah. bucks. Yeah. So that means the group has four hundred dollars, and let's say the group has to. Uh, so then we say, all right, as a as a group, you need to contribute two hundred dollars. So half of the amount that you have, basically, uh, to uh, a fund, a threshold, right? So, and if you contribute this two hundred dollars, at least two hundred dollars, as a group, then you save the rest of the money that you have. Right. If you don't, you stand some cha- high probability of losing it all. So that's where the disa- so it's supposed to model sort of catastrophic climate change, but right. it can model any sort of disaster, right? So we've also framed it in terms of like a town trying to build a levy or something because yeah. a flood is coming or whatever. So if you don't get enough money to buy the levy, then you're all going to die or be flooded or whatever. And if you do, then you save what you got left, right? So of course, there's still this free riding incentive because I would prefer that you pay the money to, to meet the to threshold me. as opposed to me because then I'm even better off. But if nobody pays anything, then we all lose everything or have a high probability of losing everything or anything. So Lately, we've been trying to apply this to uh, things like um, sort of new technologies in um, 
climate mitigation, okay. right? So, and other things that don't actually exist yet. Because, and so it's hard to study them. And yeah. so we think that can justify studying the lab because, you know, one thing that's nice about sort of laboratory economics experiments is that you can create this artificial world. And so it, the bad thing is it's artificial and many people like to, you know, harp on that idea. And, you know, that does have some limitations. But the good thing is, is that you can create the world you and you know exactly how that world works. Yes. Right? Now, there's always a problem of whether... The way that you say the world works is how the pe- the participants understand it, uh, and not there's some disconnect there often. But you know you try to deal with that. So so we think like it, it, we're trying to argue that um, you know these types of laboratory experiments are especially useful in this in this context because these are worlds that actually don't yet exist, but we can create them, but or at least create their, recreate their strategic features. Where the future may yeah. be going, and so yeah, to exactly. understand and of these future exactly. worlds, and, and, and so the the intergovernmental panel on climate change you know they produce these dire reports every year blah 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 you know terrible and but increasingly they've said you know we've waited so long to do sort of traditional mitigation that we're almost certainly going to need to do something more radical like carbon capture and storage or geoengineering or something like that uh in order along with traditional mitigation stuff in order to actually do you know prevent disastrous climate change and so we have paper that we recently published where we did this basic disaster game, but instead of just like having a, a simple contribution where you can donate one dollar and that will get you one dollar thro- closer to meeting this threshold, we gave them two contribution options: one, the standard one, one dollar gets you one dollar closer, and another sort of risky option where one dollar might get you gives you fifty percent chance of getting two dollars closer and fifty percent chance of getting zero dollars closer. So okay. it's like investing in some risky technology that you don't know if it's going to work yet. Yeah. It might pay off big time, might pay off not at all, right? And so, and then what we did was we manipulated the the size of the threshold. So at some point, if the threshold gets big enough, you there's no way you can meet it through traditional contributions. So some people have to gamble, right? But then it's a coordination problem, sort of like who's going to do the gambling, right? Who in this group yeah, of four, yeah, or yeah, group however of four. many that yeah, group yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Group of four or six. We usually do four just because it's cheaper. The original ones were done with six or whatever. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there's this, not this is an academic yeah, study exactly, funded exactly. by universities. So exactly. let, let's so, be real. Yeah. yeah, so we try to be uh, cheap if we can. Uh, and so, and yeah, and so what we do find is that, I mean, sort of optimistically, is that uh, as the threshold does get bigger, as people need to make these gambles, they understand they need to, and we do see more of this behavior. It's so fairly, you see more of cooperative. Yeah, 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 exactly. And more, and not just more, and it's, and the funny thing is, it's not that people are, you know, not, so they're, they're making the trade-off between, so some people, of course, never contribute anything, uh, but like, mostly people are just switching their con- which way the contribution, either with the sure thing or with the risky one, in a very rational kind of way. But, but they're still making the contribution. They are. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're doing, when they need to make the riskier contributions, we see a lot more of that. So wow. it's actually optimistic. So one of, the, one of the funny things about doing these kind of games, so we've done a lot of these uh, disaster, various versions of this disaster game, and you see a lot more cooperation than you would expect. So that's somewhat optimistic. Except we wonder, you know, again, since this is artificial and people know, it's pretty funny. So, like, yeah, right. doing, um, so, you know, we've run a lot of these. So, if you, especially if you do them on, on Mechanical Turk online, right, and you're talking about climate change, then you get all kinds of comments <laughs> about yeah. things, right? Including people saying that, oh, you know, you're just in the pocket, you know, you, you're just doing this because you get all this money for, you know, studying climate change. I don't know who's getting all this money. It's not me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but you get all these crazy comments. But what you see is that even these people who are climate deniers, so you know, this really great graduate student, she tracks like, you know, because we let them do open-ended comments at the end, she like, you know, codes people as kind of climate deniers or whatever to see if they act differently. They don't actually. So they say like, yes, I contributed, but just because I wanted to make money, and I understood the game, but I think climate change is a bunch of nonsense or something, right? But in this context, you know, because we frame these, we tell them that it's like, imagine this is a climate change scenario exactly. or something, right? But so they're willing to sort of put this aside for the purposes of this, uh, you know, experiment, sort of, even if they're like, well, you know, we know that you're just some liberal, you know, political scientist who loves climate or wants to stop climate change, but we think it's a hoax, right? But we're still going to play along because we want to make money. So I don't know what the insight there is. Maybe that, you know, got to make people put their money where their mouth is, right? And then maybe if push comes to shove, they'll... I don't know. But anyway, so it's kind of interesting. What about the presence of free riders? I'm always curious about, uh, from an economic perspective, Uh um, Kurt and I have done a lot of work in incentives. Yeah, sure. And uh, and so I'm always curious about 
the presence of free riders mm-hmm. in a situation like this is right. it pretty consistent uh, from game to game, well, like or does it vary term. significantly by the rules or the, the kinds uh, of things yeah, you're doing? Yeah, it does tend to vary. I guess so. Sure, you'll get. Um, I guess where it probably varies the most is whether you do sort of one shot games, so where you're just making one decision, or yep. you know the original ones uh, using this disaster game uh, from Malinsky and, and these guys. And you know, some of the ones that we've done, you do it over multiple rounds, right? right. So you use like many contribution decisions. So there, you typically see less uh, so free riding because there's the, the, the shadow of the future or whatever that you you know you want to because and there's conditional cooperation. So you see, yeah. so but but then one thing you see in those that there's there's often quite a divergence. Uh, in terms of groups based on the initial contributions, right? right. So, so if a group happen, just happens that somebody wants to contribute initially, that's very good for incre- like long-term. In- long-term cooperation. Whereas if, for whatever reason, people start off on the wrong foot, it's really hard to recover from So that. those initial states uh-huh. really impact they really future do. states. Yeah, so. and conditional cooperation is very important. Uh, you know, also in terms of climate change, there's a lot of public opinion research that if you ask people, like in an international context, right, uh, Okay, so how, what sort of you know uh, international treaties or whatever you would support? There's always a strong component of, well, we're happy to have a, our country do stuff as long as other countries are doing as stuff long as too, others, yes. right? So like, there's this very strong like sort of moral idea or ethical idea of like conditional cooperation of right? fairness of equity, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, that yeah, component, yeah. and yeah. that's a huge issue. Equity, you know, because of the historical responsibility for climate change and all that kind of stuff. <sighs> Very, very complicated. Yeah, the psychology this, behind yeah, 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 how yeah. people think sure. about that. Uh, going back to the free rider component, uh-huh. do in these in in the these games, do people know what other people have contributed? So, do they understand yes. that Tim yes. is the free rider yeah, uh, and I am the one who is putting in lots and well, lots so, of my money which for the of good, course, public that would good? Be, that would not be the case. You would be, be the be. free rider. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we don't typically. Uh, and I think this is pretty standard. So, one, you don't want. So, like the uh, the fact that you guys know each other, or the fact that you can even see each other, or whatever, might exactly. create some noise. So, typically, we do it like so. People come into the lab. You know, they're in dividers, so you, they sit in a computer and they can't right. see next to them. But they still see each other. But the groups are anonymous. But yeah. you do know, you can sort of track players because, like, you know, after every, if you do it, like, you know, multiple rounds, then you'll have a screen, or at least the way we do it, I think it's pretty common. You'll have a screen that says, okay, player one contributed this, player two contributed that. So you can at least track, you know, well, player, player two is the free is, rider yeah. or, or whatever, right? Okay. Uh, so, so, so it's, yeah, it's so a they, limited, there's not the face to face component in it, but you do yeah. know maybe sure. player two. Right. Well, is, and, I mean, is, the problem is you don't want like them to beat each other up after they leave the lab or yeah. something. It's like, wow, you were, I saw you. you, I saw, you know, they saw, yeah, and this yeah, is over like yeah, 10 bucks? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, the people, if Turk has taught us anything, it's that people get can get really worked up over small stakes. Because yeah. um, I've had people call me things I've never even heard of uh, because I didn't pay them 50 cents Online? on Turk or something. Uh, Inturk, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, that's a fascinating component in and of itself. There's a whole it's, other it's, that's area another discussion. Yeah. That you could go yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, it's fascinating to me again with your first study and kind of looking at you know uh, cognitive overload along mm-hmm. with with this this cooperation component and all these factors. So, it, do you hold out hope? Uh, this is the question. I mean, if climate yeah, yeah. change is kind of this component that's coming down the line. Yeah. With the research and what you've seen, you mm-hmm. know, are you holding out hope that there is a possibility that we'll cooperate so, and yeah. be able to make a difference? So, right. So that's that's a really good question. I, so, you know, I always tell people that, like, uh, you know, I study climate change for a living, so I'm, you know, always depressed. But that's so. Actually, though, <laughs> I guess so. I'm actually though, I don't know. So, of course, what's actually happening in terms of like international action. Is, is not very comforting. Okay. But actually, I think the fact that I've done all of these studies makes me more optimistic rather than less because, like I said, we in, at least in these disaster games, and again, the question is always like the external validity, right? Like how does this, what we do in this artificial environment in the lab, you know, apply to the real world? But if it does apply at all, then people are actually more cooperative than you would expect. So yeah, um, which so would, so there's reason to be hopeful. Yeah, I think so. There's reason yeah. to be hopeful. Okay. If, if the results would have been the alternate, yeah, sure. it, you would exactly. probably be more depressed. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so 
it's you know it's complicated. I do think so. Uh, you know, apart from my own research and stuff, I, I, I'm becoming more optimistic just because I, I it's seeming more and more likely that there will be technological solutions, okay. uh, which won't require sort of widespread behavioral behavior change. change, right? But, Which I would mean, be so much better if we just didn't have to change a damn thing. Yeah, exactly. It? It'd be a lot easier. Uh, so, <laughs> but one interesting thing is, so that's actually another thing that we're, we haven't done the research yet, but we're working on a, a design, right, using this disaster game, but to look at, so people are, so a lot of times people talk about geoengineering, right? And when they talk about geoengineering, there's different kinds, but mostly it's like solar radiation management where somehow you try to put some kind of chemicals, like usually some kind of sulfur compounds in the atmosphere to like reflect back more of the sun's rays, yeah. right? So it's not, so it's like an inverted greenhouse effect or whatever, like reducing. Yep. Okay, so so in theory, some of these things work. They've never really been you know, applied uh, on a grand scale, so we don't really know. But one concern that people have is that actually even if they work, they might convince people that they work too well. And as the IPCC says, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right, they say that even if we do this kind of stuff, we still need to do the traditional mitigation stuff too. But what people are worried about is, you know, what they talk about in insurance markets, like the moral hazard, right? Yeah. So now that we've got this insurance against climate change, this magic bullet, I can, you know, go whatever and drive my Ferrari around everywhere or whatever yeah. it is, right? So, like, people are worried about well, this. Kurt would. Yeah, yeah. He, well, all, yeah, I'm sure he's got a, a number of Ferraris. Uh, uh, but so a whole so, stable. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's a que so so that's a really interesting question there. And again, I think it's a question that. We need to, before we start to implement these geoengineering schemes, we need to know something about these behavioral responses to them. That's exactly. And so this is a plug for my type of research, right? We can sort of, I mean, even if we don't understand the exact uh, geoengineering scheme that's going to be implemented, the sort of strategic aspects we can model, we can abstract into a laboratory experiment and, and get some idea of how people might behave under these circumstances, well, right? Well, you, you think about the unintended consequences of uh, many, many different things, and mm -hmm. it's understanding that, that behavioral aspect of what these, the behaviors that whatever the implementation is drives. Yeah. Because sometimes we go, oh, Geoengineering, great. Then well, we don't have to. Do, but, <laughs> but if it results in the fact that, wow, now I can drive my SUV twice as much, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. can, you know, use hot water in you know all my clothes or mm -hmm. whatever it would be. The, you mm -hmm. know, small <laughs> little things, right? But they're not mitigating those other factors. Mm -hmm. Then the result is the same, or or even potentially worse. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'd like to uh, turn over to music, if that's okay. Sure. And uh, before we do, I just have to acknowledge that I think this is the very first time in the nearly 100 episodes that I said something to Kurt and he was actually speechless coming back. So I just want to make a note of that. So, so Ruben, you're Notice. you're part of history right here. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I am. I am very happy to hear that. So, uh, so let's talk about music. Uh, you are a big funk guy. I do. I like a lot of funk, especially, so, you know, of course, I like the classic ones like P-Funk, uh, you know, or all of the different names that... Uh, Rick James, yeah, 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 Parliament. Yeah, 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 Parliament, all the different names of bands that George Clinton had. For <laughs> they were all great. Yeah, they were all the, the hundred, yeah. whatever hundreds That's of right. those were. That's right. uh, and also, you know, Sly and the Family Stones and the, those guys. Going way uh, back. But, uh, you know, there's some newer sort of, I don't know if they call it neo-funk or neo-soul or new, I don't know, whatever they call it. Uh, so there's these guys, the Black Pumas, I really like, uh, that just came out with some stuff. There's also sort of more like a kind of uh, instrumental funk bands like uh, the new master sounds okay. and, and the bamboos and stuff uh, i guess they're not entirely instrumental but largely instrumental that's like this old school kind of funk it's kind of funk jazz or something i guess uh so yeah i like that kind of stuff um what got uh, you interested in that i don't know I mean, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I right, honestly well, well, don't know. I mean, I, I you know, when I grew up, uh, growing up, like, in high school and stuff, I mostly listened to, like, classic rock and stuff. I come from, like, a rural Ohio, so that's the kind of stuff. It's either that or country, so that was mostly on the, like classic rock. That was rock. on the radio. Yeah, that's yeah, what exactly. you got to listen and, to. Uh, yeah. And so, but then my, I don't know, my tastes have evolved a lot, and I, I don't know, I like most different kinds of music. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's not any kind of genre that I totally issue, I guess, um, you know, the modern country I don't like so much, but, you know, a lot of the classic country, Willie Nelson or Johnny Cash and that kind of yeah, stuff. Hank Williams, yeah, Hank Williams. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. that's terrific stuff, isn't um, it? But yeah, I really like, you know, all kinds of music. I just so, like, well, mm -hmm. I just, no, I just think it's amazing uh, to kind of grow up in a classic rock world mm -hmm. uh, and then actually say, well, 
I think the stuff that I really want to listen to now is mm-hmm. going to be not just Sly and the Family Stone, but mm-hmm. the bamboos, you know, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. just like, wow. I mean, I still listen to Led Zeppelin and stuff, and I love Led Zeppelin yeah. and that and the Rolling Stones, whatever. But yeah, I mean, my do you horizons choice. have broadened. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use uh, music to prime you, or do you use music in different ways uh, for different events or, you know, as ways to celebrate or relax? or Yeah, you know, yeah, all things? of those things. Yeah, I use yeah. it to relax. Different sometimes. playlists. Yeah, I got different playlists. I got a work playlist, which is, you know, mostly instrumental stuff because I have a hard time tuning out the lyrics. Yep, uh, that's the same as me. Um, uh, and especially if it's song. I mean, sometimes if I really know the song, it's sort of like going on in my head, but it doesn't, like... It's I guess since it's so ingrained in my head, it doesn't affect my other processing capabilities or something. But typically, I try to do like instrumental stuff so I don't get. Is it like low key? Is it is it high energy or is it? It depends. So another thing I really love uh, is Afrobeat. You know, Fela Kuti, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. So that's pretty high energy. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And, And it's not only instrumental. But a lot of it's instrumental, and oftentimes he's singing in his native uh, language or whatever, some kind of pidgin English. I don't understand yeah. any of the words anyway, so no. it doesn't really distract. It's just me. another musical yeah. Yeah. And you instrument. To one that... song, and it's like you know, twenty-five minutes long or something. So it gets you through a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. like all of his songs are crazy. I, I, yeah. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Portuguese folk music for that reason oh, because I really? don't I don't speak Portuguese, uh-huh. oh, but, but the stuff is mm-hmm. just super cool, mm-hmm. and and the, and they'll they'll play oh, really? songs for ten minutes. And I don't know anything about Portuguese folk music. Is it at all related to kind of the Brazilian music that we know about? No, well, Brazilian no. is way more totally. Afro yeah, sure, in, sure, influence, yeah, all, right? Sure, of course. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it's just more. Uh, it, it's just got more uh, native uh, European style instruments. Oh, interesting. So it's it's much less percussive. Uh, it's more sure. melodic. Huh? And is there is it sort of something like a flamenco version? Yeah, of yeah, oh, exactly. All, all, oh. all those kinds of things. Yes, huh, that's that's a good way of thinking about it. Oh, very is, cool. Is uh, very similar to the the Spanish stuff. Oh, very all cool. that Iberian Peninsula stuff is kind of all all <laughs> similar. But yeah. they were also influenced by the, the, uh, the Gale, the Gales from. Uh, oh, sure, uh, because they came down like in a, in a, from in, Ireland yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, so course. you get yeah, this yeah, really yeah. weird cross cultural thing going with huh, with some cool. fiddles and and uh, and. Uh, oh. uh, God, you know, right. all, all those kinds oh, of instruments. Wow. Yeah, so it's very cool stuff. Tim's yeah. making a, a, a hand motion to, to indicate some sort of instrument oh, yeah, here that accordion. I can't. That's what I was looking for. Yes, yes, it was. Ah, yeah. so then like in, in, in Galicia or something. Yeah, because there's a big Gaelic influence in Galicia, right? Yes. There, which is that sort of little place that's in Spain, but they speak some weird language that's a version of Portuguese and Spanish mixed together. Yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. That That's it, exactly. Yeah. Huh. Okay, that's fun. Well, Ruben, thank cool. you so yeah, much. Thank so you guys so much. It's been, it's been great. Yeah, it's really great. Really, really great thank discussion. Thank you for your yeah, time. So and and we're, we look forward to hearing more about some of the stuff. And I'm glad yes. you're hopeful. So, Especially yeah. all the, the veins of research that are going to come off of this current stuff. I yeah, think it's I hope fascinating. So, yeah, we're, yeah we're, this, is, this stuff is in the early stages. So we hope to do some more stuff because there's something there, we think. We just got to figure out what it is. Yeah. All right. Terrific. Well, thank, okay. you. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavior groups interview, have a free flowing discussion and whatever else comes into our multiple choice brains, multiple choice brains, Yeah, Yeah. multiple choice. We got lots of choices to choose from. We can go this way. We can go that way. We got this whole list of choices. Or we we can go, or we can do multiple things, not just one thing. Yeah. 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 That's a big, that's a big, big difference. So much of uh, the decision-making research has been around this or that. Right. Right. You know, Kahneman Tversky's early stuff was this or that. And now we're looking at what Ruben's looking at is this and this and this and this, not that and that and that. Right. It's picking five jars of jam instead of just one. Right. And that it's infinitely more complex. Yes. You know, to to study. So I just have a lot of respect for, for him and his colleagues for going and going after this stuff. All right. So so what did you find most interesting from this, Ruben's conversation? This hard versus easy thing is so interesting that um and because in some ways it kind of relates back to things that we've heard from Bob Cialdini about the way things are framed. Mm-hmm. And so this is giving people an opportunity to sort through a list themselves and say, this is going to work for me and this won't work for me. And so I can, I get to look at a list of things that are choices, you know, options and say, some of these things are just going to be easier for me. And so I'm more likely to act on those. If you just give me the whole list of all the easy things, I'm less likely to act on them. I think this was a that's counterintuitive. Really it is counterintuitive. I find because it really I'm fascinating. Going, wow, if these are all easy, I should just be able to do them. Why not? But yes. there's that 
comparison. There's that relativity to the other choices on that list that you're more likely to do the easy ones if you compare them. Go, oh, that's really hard to do. I, I'm not going to do that, but I can do these now. These yeah. are easy to do. Yeah, so like, like, feel- like like here's the list. You know, um, you know, uh, move the Oreos to the basement. Uh, you know, walk for 30 minutes every day, and um, you know, stop drinking three bottles of wine a night. Okay, so those are pretty easy things to do, right? Right, right, right. yeah. And yet, if they're not, if they're only framed as just those three things without a and run a marathon, it's like, oh, no way, I'm not going to run a marathon, but I can easily, I can easily give up drinking three bottles of wine a night. So, wow. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have to have an intervention with you about I'm three bottles of a, wine? No, I'm not. I'm I mean, just, I'm sure. I, I, I know I'm concerned if that was the case, and maybe our listeners would, might be too. It would be a concern. But okay. That's, that's, All right. Just, no, just making just, sure. I was just making shit up. All right. Okay. <laughs> you never do that. I know. I know. <laughs> you know, I, it, it's really interesting to me that that component of the relative difference. And again, it goes back to some of the work that we saw Dan Ariely do on pricing where he has the dummy variable in there, right? The, the decoy, The right? decoy effect, yeah, right? Of right. the Economist magazine and the, the pricing and you have one price that's really high and really low. And so how do you get those various different things in there? But there is that, you know, making those decisions to act or not act when you have this all easy versus easy and hard together. And it's counterintuitive. And it also reinforces the, the fact that context matters. Yes. The way that we perceive things is, is just right in front of us, right? Right. Uh, out of sight, out of mind. If we're not given, if we're not shown other choices, then we don't, we don't consider them. So how do you, how do you take this into account with things like um, BJ Fogg and tiny habits or habits or even going with James Clear and atomic habits, smaller than tiny, right? They're atomic. <laughs> I know. They're really small. Atom size. Atom sized, right? So but how do you so what I'm understanding from them is we just have to get these easy things going on. And I'm not sure if they're they're now contrasting those with well, with harder things, but does that matter in that context? Are we taking this am well, I thinking no. about this all wrong? Well what if what if we looked at the likelihood of adopting two or three tiny habits or microscopically small atomic habits <laughs> eatsy, eatsy ones. <laughs> um, just as they are in and in one condition and in another condition they're framed against something that's more difficult yeah like what you know the uh, again the adopting small here's here's three small habits you could do or here's five habits you can choose from three of them are small and two of them are really damn difficult right. It would be an interesting. I don't know if there's been research done on that. At least, not yeah. that I know of. I don't know. Maybe Wendy Wood has done some stuff. I don't know. But uh, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. So, any researchers out there, if you find this interesting, you know, just attribute the idea to us. You know, <laughs> as we're talking about this. All right. <laughs> uh, the, so what that, else? That what? variety of choice, right? Yeah. So let's extrapolate. He was talking about this piece of having that variety in there, and that was important. So if we go back to the jelly study, all right, you know, and again, Sheena Yangar's work, right, I went, and they yeah. had the five or six jars in the sample table versus the thirty or whatever it was. Is there a component that would have said, "Hey, if you would have just had variety in those jellies beyond the similar jelly flavors, right? If you would have had these five jars cost twenty dollars, and the other fifteen cost." you know, $5 each. Mm -hmm. Or if you had, hey, this is cactus jelly, uh, something really weird, you know, super hot, spicy jalapeno jelly that, you know, are beyond or spinach jelly. I don't know. Something really (laughs) weird, right? (laughs) And you you have those where there's very different than the other. So you're, you're contrasting would that have uh, or, made a or, difference? Or, or split them into subgroups. Here's here's four cactus jellies and four, you know, spicy jellies and four spinach jellies, and each one has a different and there's there are different types within those, right? Yeah. There's the kale and spinach and the peanut butter and spinach jelly, and I don't know, <laughs> just riffing off you know, of this. <laughs> if if somebody if we see a spinach and peanut butter jelly that comes out, <laughs> I am gonna sw- we're gonna we're gonna go after those people and we're gonna say no, we need some royalties from oh. this because it was our idea first right here right now <laughs> you're experiencing this live yes 
Yeah, I wonder that that categorization categorization of can these make it right can make a difference, right? Because so, it breaks it down for us, and this this makes it easier for us to both include and exclude, right? Because then like, we could say, God, oh, no, I'm not having nope. any of those spinach ones, but <laughs> you know, man, I, I would have thought you would have gone for the spinach jellies. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell? If it was beer jelly, I might be drinking, I might be going for that, but damn right. it, no. All right. But but part of this, uh, part of what Ruben informs me of is this idea of I feel better if I can exclude something so that I can include something else. That's insightful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really me. insightful. I, I can do that. I can, <laughs> I, I can bring the insight on. <laughs> wow. All right. All right. So what else? Well, that was that was it for me. I thought you you you, you had something that well, you wanted to you, talk about. Well, you brought this up at the beginning, right? Where he, uh, it, where you're looking at, we had these typical options that the research had done before of this or that, and he's bringing up this this whole work of it's not this or that. It's this 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 and this, and maybe not that that that. So the this choice architecture about people you know, making multiple decisions or, or behaviors or choices versus a single choice. And so the research around that and how much harder that is to study and how much more research probably needs to be done in that area. Yeah, it, it's, it's ripe with opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because the real world is often more complex than I'm going to choose a television, a single television, and I've got 4,000 things, so I'm going to filter, 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 and then just I'm going to get down to two or three, and then, oh, I'm going to choose Samsung because it's a good name. Yeah. Boom. And I'm done. Uh, rather than I actually have to choose five things or there are five really good things that I could do and I can actually do all of those things. The, there's a lot of those opportunities in the world that have not been fully explored in the academic research. Right. And and the elements of what choice comes first and how that influences subsequent choices and what yeah. are the, the contrasting choices that I have and do they make a, a difference again to this point? You know, all right, buying a television versus buying a stereo versus buying this. And I have to go outfit my entire, you know, new house, right? And I want to do that. I have all these choices to make. And so there's trade-offs with all of those. And yet it's not like I'm just buying a television. I'm buying furniture, television, other aspects. And so how do those trade-offs happen and what happens within that? So Definitely. All right. Okay. I've got a musical question for you. All righty. I'm so excited. Uh, I saw recently that Huey Lewis and the News released their first record in 17 years. You're pretty excited about this? Oh my God, I could uh, barf right now. <laughs> Huey Lewis and the News was like my most hated band from when I was in high school. I hated, hated, hated them. I'm happy to be stuck with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's just like the worst bad pop overproduced crap. Anyway, oh. <laughs> I, I don't have strong opinions on this at all. So yes, they, oh, they produced man. a brand new brand wow. new new album. What so, about it? Oh, so the question <laughs> is, wow, I didn't re- I've never heard you be so visceral. <laughs> negatively visceral about any any music in particular. Um, here's the question. Okay. What do you think about... So uh, Huey Lewis and the News was popular in the early 80s, mm-hmm. mostly. And what do you think about them coming back 30 years later and recording a new record? For, well, all these guys are in their late 60s and early mm-hmm. 70s now. What, what do you think about that? So if it wasn't Huey Lewis and the News, I'd go, great. <laughs> Seriously. No, I, I, the... There are bands that are that were popular back in the 80s, 90s, 70s that haven't been around, haven't done new music. Mm-hmm. And I think that there could be a potential of them being and bringing in an, a, a, a new perspective, maybe reinvigorating some of the old style of music that they had. Okay, so, so that, that gets us into sort of the criteria of what you think would make a good comeback record. Okay. So, right. So you want it to be relevant for today? No. Not necessarily? Not can it, necessarily. Can it just be a, an echo of the past? I think it could be an echo of the past because we have, it's like fashion, right? Every 20 years that fashion comes back around, right? Pretty soon we're going to see bell bottoms again, I swear. And just call me on that. <laughs> oh, no. Right? You heard so, it here you, first, you folks. You heard it here first. <laughs> Couple firsts here. But- I think there's that element that you can you can do that. Plus, you're you're targeting. You may be targeting an audience that 
was, you know, liked you. I don't know all those crazy people that like Huey Lewis in the news. Huey Lewis <laughs> there were in the a lot. news there were back a lot. in the early 80s, you know, all of those people. And I'm sorry if any of our listeners are those. They had several top 10 hits. They did. And yeah. so they're re-engaging with that audience, not necessarily branching out into new audiences, but I think they could too. You could do that. Devo, didn't Devo release a new album relatively within the past few years? And they had been off the chart for a while. So, oh, yeah. you know, and again, I, I think there's some value in that. And I think for the the musicians themselves, as we've talked about from a monetary perspective, you know, they're not probably going to make a ton of money off of the album sales or the record sales, but no. having a new album gives you an opportunity to tour, to tour maybe and maybe get into some tour places that you wouldn't necessarily get into with which, just not having. Which, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you're playing casinos. Yeah. Yeah. Well, casinos have a lot of money. Well, <laughs> don't they pay a lot for those musicians coming in to I, take people away from the, the, gambling tables? I don't know. I don't know what they're paying, but oh, okay. I have a feeling they're paying a lot less than than arenas are paying. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Do you think Huey Lewis and, and the News would be able to do an arena tour? I don't think they could. I don't think they could either. No. I, I, damn. Damn, I would. Yeah, you you, you, you're happy about that on, on some level, though, aren't you? Just, nah, I don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging with us here for another grooving session, and stay tuned for our bonus track. Groovers, this is Tim with the bonus track and groove idea. The work we discuss with Ruben is about trade-offs and the context in which we perceive them. In listening to his findings, we realize how our decision-making relies on a context that allows us to compare one thing to another. Without something to compare to, decisions become more difficult. Even when we have a list of things that we ought to consider easy, we are less likely to act on them if the entire list is perceived as easy. Having something difficult on the list makes the rest of the list actually a little more appealing. In one study, researchers asked people who favored a particular political candidate to put a very large yard sign for their candidate in front of their house. And few did it because it was hard. But following up that request with a very simple request to put a sticker on your car was met with very positive responses because it was easy. Your groove idea for this week is to think about how you frame discussions with your colleagues. When you need help from a teammate, do you give them options? Do you offer them a choice between an easy and a difficult thing? Write down a request that you expect to make of an associate in the coming days and frame it in such a way that allows them to make a choice between a very difficult option and your very simple request. So please, if you like these episodes, share them with a friend, leave a review, or give us a five-star rating. We also want to hear from you. Please reach out to us with ideas, thoughts, and feedback. And as always, thanks for listening and allowing us the opportunity to do the thing that we love. Thank you. Thank you.